Hello, and welcome to Legends of the Nahani Valley. In this documentary, we're going to explore some of the greatest mysteries of Northern Canada, the stories and legends surrounding the watershed of the South Nahani River. Believe it or not, these stories were once among the most famous folk tales in all of Canada. Based on native myth and prospector lore, they started making their way into Canadian newspapers in the early 1900s. Soon, they began to feature in magazines and radio broadcasts. By the 1940s, they had garnered international attention and were even inspiring expeditions into the subarctic. Unfortunately, these incredible tales have since faded from public memory and, for many years, were all but forgotten. Until now. Without further ado, here are the legends of the Nahani Valley. Enjoy. For such a young country, Canada has a whole lot of mysteries. From strange animals to haunted hotels, the Great White North is home to all manner of bizarre and unexplained phenomena. Of all the weird and wonderful locations in this vast and beautiful country, perhaps the strangest is the valley of the South Nahani River, a remote mountain waterway nestled in the southwest corner of the Northwest Territories. Over the centuries, this region has witnessed an unusual number of violent deaths and mysterious disappearances, which have given rise to all sorts of myths and legends. Some of the more gruesome of these have bequeathed this wild corner of Canada a ghastly epithet. The Headless Valley For the past half century or so, the Nahani Valley has been a destination for hardcore outdoor adventurers. Every year, canoeists travel there to try their luck in the rapids of the South Nahani River, and climbers fly in to test themselves against the rugged walls of the Mackenzie Mountains. The Nahani Valley has always been a lonely and secluded place. There are no roads there, and even today, the best way to reach it is by bush plane. Hundreds of years ago, this land of myth and mystery was even more difficult to get to. The only way in was on foot. Centuries before the first white explorers paddled their canoes into the country, local Diné Indians gave the Nahani Valley a wide berth. They considered it an evil place filled with bad medicine. Every once in a while, when a band was in danger of starvation, native hunters ventured into the valley in search of game. Most of them were never seen again. The few who returned regaled their fellows with all sorts of horrifying tales. Some said that the valley was home to an evil spirit who could make men vanish like smoke in the wind. His unearthly shrieks echoed throughout the canyons on windy nights. This specter was not the only sinister presence said to haunt the region. Legend has it that the valley was also the domain of a race of hairy, man-eating giants known as Nakani. These monsters dwelled in the valley's caves during the day and came out at night to hunt. The Dene were terrified of these wild men who stalked them through the forest and watched them at night, lurking in the shadows just beyond the light of the campfire. Hunters, foolish enough to wander from the safety of the camp, were snatched up by these creatures and carried away into the darkness, never to be seen again. A third class of Nahani residents were members of the Naha tribe, a fierce, primitive people who descended from their mountain homes to raid Diné settlements in the lowlands along the rivers. In ancient times, a party of Diné warriors headed into Naha territory to strike back at these Stone Age tribesmen. When they finally came to a Naha camp, however, they found it completely deserted. It was as if their enemies had vanished into thin air. Fearing that this might be the work of the evil spirit, or perhaps the dreaded Nakani, the Diné braves beat a hasty retreat back to the lowlands, never to return to the valley again. Today, many anthropologists believe that these old Indian tales were nothing more than myths, fictional stories which served important functions in Diné society. The legend of the Nakani, they say, encouraged children to stick close to camp, where they were safe from wild animals and other dangers. 
The tale of the Naha tribe, on the other hand, is said to be a relic of a bygone age when the tribes of the Mackenzie Mountains were in a state of perpetual warfare. Maybe these stories were just fairy tales designed to reinforce the cultural norms. Or maybe there's more to them than meets the eye. After all, the Diné Indians weren't the only ones to tell strange tales about the Nahani Valley. In 1789, a Scottish explorer named Alexander Mackenzie paddled his canoe into Great Slave Lake and down a great river known to the natives as De Cho. He and his crew worked for the Northwest Company, a great fur trading enterprise based in Montreal. They hoped that this river was the final leg of the Northwest Passage, a legendary waterway connecting the Atlantic Ocean with the Pacific. Alexander Mackenzie and his crew were the first white men to venture into that part of the country, known today as the Mackenzie region. In fact, the only other Europeans in the Northland at that time were Russian fur trappers who lived far to the west on the Pacific coast. With the exception of these frontiersmen, the Canadian North was populated exclusively by Diné and Inuit tribes. On their way down the river, Mackenzie and his crew met some of the locals who told them much about the surrounding territory. They whispered of the warlike Inuit who lived further north and of a ferocious tribe that lived to the west in the mountains. They called their fearsome westerly neighbors the Nahani Indians. Although the waterway that Alexander Mackenzie and his men explored, now called the Mackenzie River, led north to the Arctic Ocean rather than west to the Pacific, it nevertheless opened up a vast new land filled with fur trading potential. The Northwest Company took advantage of the opportunity and began building trading posts along the Mackenzie River. Another great Canadian fur trading company called the Hudson's Bay Company, or HBC, followed suit after absorbing the Northwest Company in 1821. Before long, the HBC turned its attention towards the Pacific Northwest, where the Russians dominated the fur trade. Determined to find an overland route to the Pacific, they launched several expeditions west up the Liard River, a major branch of the Mackenzie. On their westward journeys, HBC explorers learned more about the Nahani Indians from the Diné they met along the way. The Nahani were said to be a reclusive people who seldom left the misty confines of the Mackenzie Mountains. They were hostile to strangers and slaughtered anyone foolish enough to trespass on their territory. Whether they were Slavey or Casca, every informant along the Liard River appeared to be deathly afraid of these mysterious men of the mountains. In the 1830s, a party of fur traders returned from the wilderness with a harrowing tale. On an expedition west, they encountered a band of Nahani Indians who were just as ferocious as native legend had portrayed them. The mountain warriors would certainly have murdered them had it not been for the presence of their leader, a beautiful, fair-skinned chiefess who commanded their absolute respect and obedience. Soon, the legend of the mysterious figure, dubbed the White Queen, rippled up and down the Mackenzie River. The men of the Hudson's Bay Company continued to trade in the Mackenzie region well into the 20th century. Aside from missionaries, a handful of frontiersmen and their rivals on the Pacific coast, they were the only permanent white resident in the North Country for many years. Then, in the late 1800s, something happened that changed the face of the North forever. Gold was discovered in the Klondike. In no time, thousands of men and women from all over the world were on their way to the northern gold fields, and the North Country was introduced to a new type of white resident, the prospector. Aftermath of the Klondike Gold Rush, 
prospectors who failed to strike it rich in the Yukon began to look elsewhere for gold. A number of these restless souls wandered into the Nahani Valley and began to pan the creeks which fed the South Nahani River. Some, who returned from these diggings, filled northern trading posts and saloons with strange tales of a tropical valley hidden away somewhere in the Mackenzie Mountains. This valley was said to be snow-free all year round, its climate attributable to hundreds of hot springs which ran through it. The valley's soil was black and fertile and supported a spectacular variety of lush and exotic greenery. The moose, caribou, and mountain sheep that lived there were said to be so well fed as to appear almost square from fat. Hand in hand with tales of a tropical valley were stories of mammoths, mastodons, and other prehistoric monsters said to roam the most desolate recesses of the Nahani. Native trappers and white prospectors alike claimed to have found fresh tracks of these creatures in the snow, and many frontiersmen returned from the wilderness bearing priceless ivory tusks with hair and flesh still adhered to the bone. Another ancient animal said to live in the Nahani Valley is an enormous wolf-like creature, eerily reminiscent of a monster of Inuit myth. Known as the Wahila, this solitary creature is said to have the ability to crush bones with its powerful jaws. Some say that it is a dire wolf, an ancestor of the modern-day timber. Others believe that it is an animal commonly known as a bear dog, which is supposed to have gone extinct about eight million years ago. In spite of all the terrifying tales of prehistoric monsters, hostile tribes, hairy giants, and evil spirits, a handful of enterprising prospectors continue to try their luck in the Nahani Valley in the hope of discovering gold. Two such men were Willie and Frank MacLeod, the Métis sons of a prominent Scottish fur trader. In the early 1900s, the MacLeod brothers, equipped with mining gear, disappeared into the Nahani Valley. They were never seen alive again. Three years after the MacLeod brothers' departure, Willie and Frank's younger brother Charlie, fearing the worst, mounted a search party the ragtag band of trappers, aboriginals, and ex-mounties he recruited headed up the South Nahani River, warily scanning the shore for anything out of the ordinary. After several days of tracking and pulling their canoes upriver, Charlie and his crew made a grisly discovery. On a flat stretch of riverbank, known thereafter as Dead Men Valley, sprawled the headless remains of Willie and Frank McLeod. Their heads were nowhere to be found. Word of the disturbing discovery spread like wildfire throughout the Canadian North. Over tea and bannock, trappers and fur traders speculated as to the nature of the McLeod brothers' gruesome fate. Had they been killed by one of the hairy, cave-dwelling giants of native lore? Had they been murdered by the mysterious Nahani Indians? Perhaps they had been beheaded by a rival prospector or a trapper gone mad, his mind shattered by years of isolation in the bush. Along with these conjectures grew rumors that the Nahani Valley was rich in gold and that the McLeod brothers had made a massive strike on one of its creeks sometime prior to their untimely deaths. In no time, whispers of the lost McLeod mine, a subarctic El Dorado where gold nuggets the size of goose eggs littered the creek beds, spread throughout the Northland. One by one, prospectors from Yukon and Alaska trickled into the Nahani, determined to strike it rich. Throughout the first half of the 20th century, dozens of prospectors met with bizarre ends in various reaches of the Nahani Valley. Many of them were found headless, just like the McLeod brothers. Some were found beside the ashes of their cabins, 
which had mysteriously burned to the ground. Others simply vanished, never to be seen again. Some frontiersmen saw these bizarre deaths and disappearances as affirmations of what they had long believed, that the Nahani Valley is cursed, and that those who dare to search for its gold are doomed to a terrible fate. Others blamed the Nahani Indians or the prehistoric monsters. Whatever the case, most of the murders and mysterious disappearances that have taken place in the Nahani Valley remain unsolved to this very day. Thank you for watching Legends of the Nahani Valley. If you enjoyed this video and want to learn more about these great Canadian mysteries, please check out the book Legends of the Nahani Valley, available on Amazon and Kindle.